Meetings this week. The trustees meet Monday at uh, 5.30, February the 20th. Finance will meet Tuesday. Leadership will, has moved their meeting to Thursday night because of Ash Wednesday on Wednesday night. All of these meetings will be in the Wesley Bible classroom at 5.30. And I just want to say a special thank you to all of you all who helped us have a very successful um, Valentine's dinner last Sunday. We had a lot of good food, had a lot of good help beforehand, and a lot of help afterwards. I think that's the first, that's the quickest we ever got out of the kitchen after having a covered dish meal. So all that help, I'm, I'm not name names because I'll miss somebody, but it's so appreciative, and I want to thank all of you for doing it. A special thank you to Georgian and Melissa because they have us a little entertainment here to lunch. So you that missed it, I hope you can join us the next time we have something. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Stand as you're able and let's have our call to worship this morning. God, we come to the mountaintop to be covered in your presence. We are comforted by your holiness and your glow. We are comforted by the hope of the mountaintop, where you are so close, so accessible, when there is no doubt of your glory. The mountaintop reminds us of why we worship you. We witness your bright power and your plan for the nations of the earth. As we prepare for worship, God, bring us to the mountaintop. Bring us to the mountaintop so that we may be inspired to do your work in the valley below. Amen. O God of the covenant, the cloud of your splendor and the fire of your love revealed in your Son on the mountain heights, transform our lives. Transform our lives into his image. Write the, your law of love upon our hearts and make us prophets of your glory that we may lead others into your presence. Amen. Amen. Open your books, please, and turn to page 103 as we sing that wonderful hymn, Immortal and Visible, God Only Wise. <laughs>
morning as we confess our faith together, you'll find the Apostles' Creed printed in your worship bulletin. We confess our faith saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, thank you as well, those of you who've been able to, uh, to give, to uh, help with uh, encore efforts uh, not around the world and also near home. I'm grateful for those of you who are able to give. I thank you all for your prayers for our brothers and sisters scattered throughout the world. Uh, but uh, we especially remember those folks in Selma that are still recovering from the tornado. Thank you for all that you have done. Let's receive our Lord's tithes and offerings this morning. God, we're grateful that we can give. Bless this offering to the glory of your name and the good of your people. We pray in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Join me down front. 
you know, Biggins and Little ones. What's up, man? How you doing? Twins stick together. That's awesome. Well, how is everybody this morning? We all right? Je Jesus, uh, our story that we're going to read today in, in, in big church is about Jesus and his friends. Y'all got, got friends? I know he got lots of friends. Right, he's got some kind of friend, right? If you don't have a friend, you got a sister, right? Or a brother. I know sometimes they feel like brothers or friends, but they turn out to be in the long run. They do. Okay. All right. They're fish. So Jesus takes three of his friends up on a mountaintop, and something exciting happens. And it's exciting for Jesus, but his friends are scared. And so the first thing Jesus does after this exciting moment of transfiguration is over is he tells his friends, don't be afraid. Sometimes as a friend, we just need to be with some folks and tell them, don't be afraid, right? Because everybody has something that they get afraid of. If it's uh, whatever's under your bed or not, or whether it's the funny little seed in the middle of that grape that's peeled in fruit cocktail. That's a little odd. Y'all are too young for that. Wait, wait, one of these days you get old inside of that. We're five. We're five. We're five. No, you're four. No, you're three. Wait, y'all keep counting in a minute, you're going to be zero. Anyway, the point is, we can all be a friend to somebody, and Jesus is our friend that the Bible says sticks closer than a brother. So we want to thank God for that. Hey, guys, we're going to pray now. We're going to pray now. Okay. You ready? Lord, thank you for Jesus, our friend that sticks closer than a brother, our friend that said he would never leave us, our friend that loves us. Thank you, Lord, for such a friend we have in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Good job, guys. Good to see you, ladies. Yeah. 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 How, how old are they? He is five. He is five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we were counting down there. I wasn't sure where we were going to line up. Okay, would you stand and let's sing, uh, I stand amazed in the presence. We'll sing the first, fourth, and fifth verse. <laughs>
seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And take a few moments and uh, lift up those things in our heart, those people, those situations that uh, we can only share with the Lord. God, we're grateful for your church. Grateful that they pray. Grateful that we have been given the privilege to walk with Jesus. We are especially grateful for the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We confess that we don't always pay attention. and That we don't always listen. Sometimes we walk off by ourselves. But God, each week we come back together to pray, to sing, to be encouraged, to lift up one another, to do what we've been called to do as your church. Lord, thank you for your church. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. God, we pray for the world this morning. God, we, we give you thanks that people are still being pulled from the rubble in Turkey. We pray for those who are suffering because of the earthquakes. We pray for those in the Ukraine who are still suffering from the effects of war. We pray, God, especially for your church there. That they might be messengers of hope. And that they might be able to provide shelter and food and, and encouragement in these days. We pray, O oh God, for the citizens of East Palestine, Ohio, for that surrounding area, how much fear there must be, Lord, knowing that there's poison in the air and in the water and on the ground and how frightening that must be. God, we pray that we might be better stewards of the creation that you have given us to be stewards, to be caretakers, to be tenders of, to be gardeners of. For Lord, as we take care of creation, we do so as if we are taking care of you and we are ministering to you. Lord, we pray for the world we live in, that your healing and your peace might rest upon it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are hurting in body, mind, and spirit this morning, for those who are afraid, for those who are awaiting test results, for those who are recovering from one surgery so that they can have another. For those littlest ones among us who are sick with a cold. For all of those, Lord, who are hurting in deep and hidden ways. We thank you, God, for the doctors and for the nurses and for the therapists and for the counselors and for the pastors that listen and help and sit with those. We thank you, God, for those who sit with our loved ones. Bless them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We thank you, God, for the communion of saints. We know that the group of saints that reside with you in heaven, we know that that group is growing. God, we remember especially this morning Ethel Reese, Dwight Bird, Tina Chancy Jackson, Ann Andrews, Bobby Anderson, Lynn Spinks. May their memory be for a blessing, Lord. We 
We pray as they pray, as you taught us, Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. <clears throat>
Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when their eyes, when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. This is Transfiguration Sunday. This is uh, the Gospels. Three out of the three out of the four Gospels record this event, and so it's important, right? They all record it a little differently, but it's important. So, uh, one of the things I want you to just kind of hang in the back of your mind is that Jesus is not only the Son of God, but in Matthew's Gospel, he's also the Son of Man, right? Let's just make those two pegs, all right? Two pegs that you hang something on. Derek Weber says there are two parts to the message of the transfiguration. The first is, this is my son, right? And we're, and, and we're all like, well, duh. Uh, of course he's God's son. But we have to remember we're on this side of the cross, right? We're, we're on this side of the resurrection. We're on this side of Pentecost. Peter, James, and John are not. <laughs> they're, they're on that side. They have seen power at work. Uh, they've seen the power of God at work in Jesus Christ. They've seen power displayed through healings and such, but they have not seen the power of the resurrection in the risen Christ after his passion. They've not seen that. And so here are, here's God telling us to listen. This is my son. This is important. Listen to it. Well, Elijah and Moses show up. Or if you will, Moses and Elijah show up. Remember back in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. When we gather at this scene, Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets. It, it is tempting in our American Christianity, in our deep south, southeastern conference, football, American Christianity, to look at this like it's a coaching moment, right? Jesus is... Uh, 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 Jesus is there and here comes Moses and Elijah whose law and prophecies he is about to fulfill. Moses and Elijah, by the way, are revered in the, in the Jewish faith as, as they are in the Islamic faith. Moses and Elijah are important. They, they still are important. Are Moses and Elijah there coaching Jesus up? <laughs> Jesus is about to make the turn towards Jerusalem. And when he goes to Jerusalem, he is going to his death. Now, we're all going to die at some point, but Jesus knew when. If some of y'all knew that come Friday you were going to be gone, it might change what you do today. You might have a list, like some of us do, of some people that you want to tell exactly what you think. Because you know after Friday they can't do nothing about it. My look, we'd have another resurrection and I'd have to suffer for what I said, right? Jesus knew that he was going to his death 
And it's comforting to me to think, honestly, it's comforting to me to think that Jesus might need a little encouragement from heaven. I mean, even the strongest among us from time to time, we need a little bit of encouragement, don't we? We, we, need, a, we need a bump every now and then, right? I think that's why the writer of Hebrews told us in chapter 10, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he that, it, he that is faithful has promised. And let us consider how to, I'm going to use old King James word, to provoke one another. We're all pretty good at provoking one another, but we're to provoke one another unto love and good works, the writer of Hebrews says. Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, as some have done but exhorting one another. That's, a, that's one of the reasons we gather on Sunday mornings is to exhort one another unto love and to good works to do what we need to do. So it's kind of comforting to me to think that Jesus might need some encouragement. I, I know that if I was going to my death on Friday, I need somebody with me to say, hey, hey, come on now. You know you can do it. But also I can't help but wonder if Jesus is not there to share a moment of joy with Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah suffered greatly for what they did so that the good news of Jesus Christ could come. And maybe Jesus is saying, guys, it's going to happen. I, I'm about to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to the cross. All that you looked for, all that you longed for, all that you spent your lives for, it's going to happen. I'm going to do it. Now that won't be the end of the story, but, but he's telling them, we're going to do it. I, I said that I would fulfill the law and the prophets, and I'm going to do it. And then Peter speaks up. I don't know if y'all have this trouble. Maybe it's just people like me, but sometimes you start talking and then about 30 seconds later, your brain engages and then you spend the next 30 seconds going, God, why did I, why, what? Or I, I rethink conversations and they, they pop up at the most inopportune times and I remember what I said before my brain was engaged and I think, what were you thinking? We get nervous and we speak up, right? We get nervous. We, it's all. And we, somebody's got to say something. Well, you don't have to. But we feel compelled to speak up. And Peter speaks up. Here's the second major point. God says, this is my son, my beloved. And then he says, listen to him. And in my sarcastic mind, I can almost see God going, they are, listen to him, they are. Moses and Elijah are listening to him, why can't you listen to him? There's a, a guy on Instagram, KB Lane. Uh, he's become famous with this, that whole, like, duh, it's obvious. This isn't the first time that Jesus has had people told off about listening to him. This is his heavenly father. But, but you remember his mama? You, you remember his mama? They were, he, she and Jesus were at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Y'all remember? Something happened and they ran out of wine. And mama said, Jesus, do something about it. And he said, well, I don't know what's not, I don't know, not my time. And then she turned to the servants and said, do whatever he says. I think it's interesting that the son of God had a mama who didn't take no for an answer. Not even from her son, the son of man. That's something to think about, isn't it? I'm sure it was awkward. Now, 
Folks used to be real concerned about the openness of God, this idea that God could change his mind. And I understand that that might be disconcerting, but even Jesus had a mama. And you know, mamas sometimes give you that look. They do, don't they? And sometimes, sometimes, right, pop and lock before they give you that look. A couple of our, my ladies at Hebron, after I preached this morning, they said, oh yeah, we used to look at our kids that way. And they knew. Mama said, do whatever he tells you. And I have no doubt she looked at them the same way. And they did. I can imagine Mary going to the wedding host when she learns that there's a problem and she says, I'll go get my son. He'll know what to do. This may be a little bit of spiritualizing, but I want you to know that if there's a problem, go get Jesus. He'll know what to do. Jesus is transfigured before Peter, James, and John. His clothes shone. The, the, the words used to describe it, that there's no words that adequately fit what happened. His clothes shone, his face shone. It was a sacred, holy moment, a transfigured Savior. A, a transformed life can, can be frightening to some. When you run into somebody whose life is completely different than when you knew them before their lives were transformed, it's a little frightening because now you don't know what they're up to. The disciples fall to the ground in fear. They've seen Moses. They've seen Elijah. They've seen Jesus. They've seen the, the glory of God. They, they've heard the voice of God Spoke up when they should have shut up. And it was all too much. I'm reminded of Isaiah 6 when Isaiah is confronted by the vision of God. And he said, woe is me, I am undone. I will die with that being one of the phrases that sticks with me out of scripture. I am undone. And the first thing Jesus says to them is, get up, don't be afraid. You see, Jesus is the son of God. God made that clear. <laughs> this is my son, the beloved. But Jesus is also the son of man. It, it occurs more in Matthew's gospel than any other gospel that Jesus is referred to as the son of man. Don't be afraid. He knew what his friends were going through. If he were not the son of God and the son of man, if he were not both human and divine, he would not know, but he does. And so whenever you are going through those moments where you are undone or afraid, Jesus knows. You see, Jesus begins to walk down the mountain with them, coaching them up and teaching them because there's work to do in the valley. We love mountaintop moments. They inspire us. Uh, the awakening at Asbury uh, University up in Wilmore, uh, Kentucky is, is inspiring folks. Re retreats and moments like the high holy days of Lent and Easter, they inspire us. We love the mountaintop experiences. But we can't see the people in the valley of despair or the slew of despond unless we get down off the top of the mountain. Because you can't see those people from the mountaintop. That's why Jesus went down into the valley. If you read on, Jesus heals a boy with epilepsy and he continues to teach. Even those people that are trying to trip him up to to. to catch him in a lie so that they can persecute him. He continues to love them to the end in teaching them. Jesus is not only with his disciples then, he's with us now. 
all the way from the mountaintops down into the valleys and all the journey in between. Derek Weber says that this moment is about worship. Worship is our moment to hear again the call of Jesus, the call to serve, the call to love, the call to give ourselves away. Worship is all about Jesus, but at the same time, it's all about us. It's about Him as the beloved Son and us as the ones drawn to Him in community and being privileged to be able to listen to Him. For a follower of Jesus Christ, every Sunday is a, is a super Sunday. Because we get to come together and worship. Matt Redmond wrote a song about uh, worship. Well, truth be known, he wrote a song about Jesus. And I think I may have sung it here. I, I sang the Randy Travis version of it because I can't quite get up to the Matt Redmond version of it. The words came to me after I read Derek Weber's comments. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, Jesus. And it's all about you. It's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing we've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It is fitting that as we head towards a holy Lent, that we have in our minds the image of worshiping Jesus with our hearts and our minds, a transfigured Savior leading us into a transformed life. I invite you to return to the heart of worship. There will be ample times over these next 40, 50 days for you to worship. We gather here each Sunday about 11 o'clock. That's a good start. I invite you to follow the Son of God, the Son of Man, our friend. Worship Him and work with Him to transform not only your life, but the lives of those around you. Amen. Lord, help us to be your servants whom you call friends. Lord, help us to look to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. In your name we pray. Amen. What a beautiful way to the song to end this service. Would you stand and turn to page 349? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. <laughs> not, I am with thee. Favorite words in the Bible, right? Be not dismayed. I love you. Jesus loves you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen.